Welcome to this short presentation on tuning the King's Hall organ. I'm Magnus Williamson and I'll be joined today by Jonathan Thorne, our organ tuner. One might play at this point a recording of an atrociously out of tune instrument just to set things into context, but I think we know what an out of tune organ sounds like, so let's get on with the show. Here we see a classic illustration of an organ from the 18th century. This is one of the most famous illustrations of an organ, and it was for Don Bedos's Art of Organ Building, which was published in France, and is the quintessential um, iconic study of organ building. As you can see, there, there are two people operating the instrument, often there would be more. Uh, you'd have the organist on the right, and at least one blower on the left. If it was a major feast, you'd need two or three blowers because the organist would be drawing more stops. Uh, and sometimes the organist themselves would need help with a registrant um, to draw, to change the stop combinations. So the blower on the left supplies the wind. He does the hard manual labour and uh, he's using three cuneiform bellows, as we can see here. Sometimes there are more. And the air which is raising goes through the wind trunk, uh, which is uh, number 16, through into the reservoir 17 and then up. Uh, through the wind trunk and into the main body of the organ and into the wind chest on top of which sit the pipes and it's the organist's job to open the holes which allow the wind from the chest into the pipes and make them sound. And basically all of those pipes on the rack at the top are whistles of one sort or another uh, with one exception. Now the organist on the right is playing um, uh, on several keyboards, uh, which you can see uh, in front of him at figure six. And the movement which he creates in those keyboards is illustrated at the top left of the picture with a cutaway there through the co cross section. And that shows you how the movement, the initially vertical movement is transmitted up into the instrument. Now, if you look back at the organist and see uh, the keyboard where it's playing, you'll also see some um, trackers or little wooden strips which transmit the vertical movement onto a roller board which is, look, looks like a series of pencils um, sitting horizontally inside the organ and they change vertical movement into um, cyclical movement and they enable you to transmit the, um, the action uh, generated by the organist over quite long distances. They are a very clever piece of kit and uh, enable very large instruments to be built. You will also notice that the organist is playing with his feet and the pedals also transmit action using trackers. Again, those go up into the main body of the instrument where the larger pipes are usually flanking the uh, main instrument in so-called towers on the left and the right of the instrument. And you will also see that behind the organist there's another miniature organ, that's the so-called rook posity, um, and that um, is spatially distinguished from the main body of the instrument and you can see that the action which the organist uh, creates at the keyboard is transmitted inside the organ and then underneath where he's sitting, underneath the organ bench uh, where he's perched and then um, through into the rook posity. A very clever piece of action there um, and absolutely essential um, to transmit the uh, organist's finger work to the front of the instrument. Now there's a little bit of social history here. You may have spotted that the organist is wearing a sword. We may reasonably doubt that organists wore swords when they played in the 18th century. However, the sword and the periwig uh, at figure four um, give some indication of the social standing of the organ player versus the organ blower on the left. Not to put too fine a point on it, with the organ, size really does matter. And an out of tune organ is usually an instrument where the maths don't quite add up properly. So, take middle C, concert pitch. Imagine you're playing that on a piano. To get the same note out of an organ, I'd need a pipe two feet long. To get the C above, I'd need a shorter pipe, half the pipe length to one foot, and then the C above that, two octaves, two octaves above middle C, 
it will be half a foot long. And the same process works in reverse as you go down the middle, see the pipe lengths double with each octave, so from two to four, and then from four to eight, to the bottom C, and then from eight to 16 with sub octave C, and then 16 doubles to 32 for the C below that, which I won't try to sing now. You will have spotted that there are some fractions here as well. One of the characteristic things of the organ is it doesn't just play octaves, it can play fifths and thirds as well. Um, and so uh, if I want to play G below middle C, the pipe I'd need to play that on would be 2.66 feet long or two and two thirds. If I want to play a C a third above middle C, I'd go from two foot to one foot three fifths. 1.6 feet long, and then to play the fifth above uh, middle C, a pipe one and a third feet long. Let's demonstrate that, starting with middle C, then the C below, the C above, uh, C two octaves below, and so on. It's almost a truism of the organ that when you play one key, you will more often than not get more than one note sounding. And you can illustrate this with one of the most characteristic sounds of the instrument, which is the so-called cornet stop. And this is basically a way to play a whole series of chords just using one key at a time. So if you draw five different stops, eight foot, four foot, two and two thirds, two foot, one and three fifths, you get the uh, fundamental note, the octave above, the fifth above that, the octave above that, and then the th third finally on top. When you play it low down, it sounds like a series of chords, but as you rise, all of the sounds blend together. And it, it's this blendability which gives the organ its characteristic color, uh, and is one of the reasons why we need to keep it in tune. So what does out of tune actually entail with an organ? Really, it's very simple. It just means that something is the wrong length. So here we have a pair of graphs, some sound waves, which I recorded earlier on in King's Hall. To do this, I used two pipes, uh, two ranks uh, or stops, which are almost the same. They're both eight foot stops so they give you modern standard concert pitch when you play each note um, but i deprived one of the stops of a little amount of air and this made it play flat now on the left you can see the graph when i'm playing them properly drawn the two pipes are sounding together i'm just playing one note here and uh, although this isn't a proper um, sound wave you can see that there isn't any um, disturbance uh, between the two stops. Uh, they, they're singing in perfect unison with each other. On the right, depriving one of the stops of some of its air, making it flat, you can see that they're nearly in tune with each other, but not quite. And that's one of the main ways by which an organ builder or an organ tuner decides whether an organ is out of tune or not. It's not ju just that it sounds bad, but you listen for the beats which are caused when two sets of sound waves are beating nearly the same, but not quite. You'll hear that in a minute.
Right, hello, my name's Jonathan, and uh, I would like to uh, demonstrate what sorts of organ pipes we have. Um, the first one, which normally people associate with, is what we call a flu pipe. And these are light recorders, if you like, um, where the air enters the bottom and it goes through a mass and the air is resonating uh, through the body of the pipe, just like, with, just like you would do with a whistle. And they work on the same basis. How you tune them, however, is done by a little plunger we call a stopper. There's a piece of wood that you move up and down to change the, the actual frequency or the, the speaking length inside the pipe. This, however, is not a flue pipe. We call this a reed pipe. And this is obviously made of metal. And there are two sections. So if I remove the the lower section, all that is, is, is we call this the boot. It's just, um, it's just part of the pipe that protects the reed inside. Now this is a reed, rather like a saxophone reed or a clarinet reed. I hope that's in focus. It's not like an oboe reed where there are two reeds vibrating against each other. Here we have a little brass reed. It's only a piece of, bit of brass and it's curved and it vibrates against this brass um, sort of component. We call it a shallot, not like the onion variety, but uh, it's all it is, is, is a bit of brass. And as the air passes through the hole here, it passes and it causes the reed to vibrate. And this section here on top is your tuning wire. And I knock the tuning wire up and down to get um, the right frequency whilst listening to something that's already in tune. It's rather like if you twang a ruler on the end of a, of a table and if you move it one way, it gets sharper, it gets faster. If you move it the other way, um, it gets slower. And that's, that's basically how, how a reed works. And of course, they all come in different shapes and sizes. But this, is, this particular reed, it's rather like a clarinet sort of sound, a sort of sound you'd have probably associate with medieval sort of black adder sort of uh, sounding type instruments. This is called the crumorn, and it's one of my favorite stops on this organ actually. <laughs>